This landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico. So the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. Brazil was the man who discovered the saucer. What I thought was a star began coming in my direction at a very rapid uh, rate of speed. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. I saw a UFO and it went down the river, turned right at the United Nations, turned left and then down the river. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. No more plausible deniability. Fact. Fiction. Or the truth. You decide. And now, the new voice of the high desert, the hostess of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes. Good evening, my friends. This is Erica Lukes, and I am happy, as always, to be here with you every Friday night. I'd like to thank my listeners from all over the world for tuning in, for reaching out, for sharing information about this show and the important guests that I bring on. And I am... I am so thrilled tonight to finally, finally have someone here who I know will be a a dear friend of mine for the rest of my life, and tonight is going to be an interesting show. But before I tell you a little bit about him, I want to just say that I will be speaking at the 2017 UFO Congress in Phoenix, so if you are in the area or even you know kind of close by in another state please make sure you you get there it is an exceptional event and this year we have speakers like John Alexander Alejandro Rojas will be speaking my friend and colleague Ted Rowe Colonel Halt from Rendlesham fame and many more people this will be a a great event and it will be fun to meet some of you who listen to my show faithfully i know that hoska will be there i can't wait to finally meet you my friend maybe irv brock can get out and and see us but on that note i just want to take a moment and talk a bit about my guest tonight tunde atun rache who i met in london about six months ago, and we sat and talked and talked for hours, and I honestly could have spent days just picking his brain, having a remarkable conversation about a topic that is intriguing. It is mind-blowing and, in my opinion, incredibly important for all of us to understand. It is remote viewing, which is a psychic functioning protocol that was developed by the military and funded. And some interesting things took place. If you haven't learned about remote viewing, tonight is your night. Tunde has authored a book that I have right in front of me that he inscribed for me. I love it. It's called Remote Viewing, UFOs and the Visitors. And this is this is a really, really cool book. It talks a little bit about Travis Walton and the Japan Airlines flight, much, much more. My guest is an IT analyst supervisor by profession, and he began delving into remote viewing way back in 1995. He was formally trained in 2001. He has done numerous private and public demonstrations of remote viewing, often volunteering his skills And he won a very prestigious award in 2014, the IRVA War Collier Prize. And that is really cool. But I suggest that you go to Amazon to get his book. I will post links of the book so you can get that. And I am just, I am so excited to have you here. Finally. Hi. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, my gosh. um, Good evening to all the um, all to you, all the listeners as well. Um, it's an honour being on your show, and um, uh, as you said, we had a great time when you came down to London. Um, a little bit nervous because I don't normally um, do radio interviews, but um, I really wanted to do this one today. You know, and, I am, um, thank you so much, and I know that you don't do this, so that's it means even more to me. Even if you weren't my friend and the, the coolest remote <laughs> viewer on the planet, I would be oh, just just honored. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me as well. Yes. Um, oh, and I, so, I've got to just throw out here really quick that you're a musician too. Um, an amateur musician. Yeah, I play the keyboards. Um, not as often as I should do. 
um, but I've recently just started getting back into it again, and I'm really, really um, loving it. I just wish I'd started much earlier, to be honest. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I love playing keyboards um, and writing songs as well. You're good. Yeah, I heard you're um, you're not too bad yourself. Oh, what back in the old days before the dinosaurs? I don't know. (laughs) It's it's hard because I mean, as you know, it's like you get so caught up in other aspects of your life, especially with both you know with what we're doing in the RV and UFO world, Mm -hmm. and it's like you don't have time to nurture that important part of yourself. And so, I'm glad that you're doing that. Thank you. Yeah, it's cool. So t- let's talk about how you first got involved in this. This is a cool story. Um, well, it's, I mean, I first found out about it back in, I think, 1995. And there was a show called The Real X-Files. And um, it was a Channel 4 show. And I just started watching it. And, um, you know, to my amazement, they started talking about this remote viewing protocol you know, that allows you to you know, see things in, you know, across space and time and uh, I was just watching the, I was watching the, the, the people on the, on, on the show you know, discuss things and I was just completely blown away and that was my first um, introduction to it um, it took a while for me to then eventually get training on that but um, yeah that was um, that was uh, quite interesting uh, since then I've been uh, trying to develop my own skills along the way. And um, I've, I have to tell you, I mean, once you start learning remote viewing, it is, it will change your life without a shadow of a doubt. Um, your, your ideas about life, consciousness, everything uh, changes. And that's really pretty much what happened to me. And I think a lot of other remote viewers as well who've eventually, who, who do take it seriously, um, like I did. And, um, yeah, so and here I am today. And, I, and we're glad about that. But it, it is really, it is so f- fascinating to me. And I know that uh, you and, you've helped me try to develop my skills a little bit. And we'll mm-hmm. talk about, you know, that in a bit. But when you first <laughs> yeah. started to do this, did you feel, were you frustrated? Were you a natural? I mean, what went through your mind when you first started training? Well, when I watched that program and I saw, you know, what they were doing, I thought it was going to be an instantaneous thing that you could just learn the protocols, which I'll talk about later on. And um, straight away, you'll, you know, you'll be able to see anything, you know, see aliens, UFOs, whatever, you know, you go, go back in the past. Uh, remote view, you know, King Solomon's Temple, you know, whatever, whatever, you, whatever you want. <laughs> that sounds good. You know, what I mean, you know, go to Mars and all that sort of stuff. And um, you know, it, it it was difficult initially because getting information back in those days was quite hard. Uh, you had to take training with one of the um, former uh, military remote viewers. And um, I'm based in the UK, and there were pretty much none. Yeah, so there was a lot of online activity. I'd have to go into forums, try and find out information. Um, it was it was it was it was difficult. And, and back in those days as well, it was a little bit chaotic as well, trying to get accurate information. And uh, but eventually, I managed to get hold of uh, someone who came over to the UK. Her name it was called Prudence, or it's called Prudence Calabrese, and uh, she eventually became my trainer. And uh, she taught me the basics of uh, the trans-dimensional systems remote viewing protocol. And um, ever since then, I I haven't looked back. It did change my life as well. And she was an amazing instructor. And uh, she was also trained by Courtney Brown, I believe. I'm not sure if a lot lot of your listeners know who he is, but he's a uh, world-famous remote viewer as well. And he's doing lots of projects, lots of um, amazing things at the moment, and um, taking remote viewing to another level, I believe. Um, but yeah, she trained under him, and um, Courtney trained under Major Ed Dames, who was one of the original remote viewers from the military program. So you could probably call myself a third generation <laughs> remote viewer. 
And um, so this was back in 2002, I think back in October 2002, that's when I first took my training with her. It was just about over several days, I think it was. And uh, my whole world just changed there and then. It was one of the most amazing things. So I do recommend, if you are serious about remote viewing, uh, which I'll, I'll go into more in depth as well about the protocols and the do's and don'ts and what remote viewing actually is, um, that you do take some form of structured remote viewing training um, and it, it will help you a lot. So, you know, when when I've kind of looked around for different remote viewing sites or, or any information, I mean, there there definitely are different schools of thought on this. Mm-hmm. Can you explain the different schools? Well, you have primarily uh, controlled remote viewing, which was developed um, back in... Um, uh, I think back in the 70s, um, out of Stanford Research Institute. And um, that was, I would say it was pr- it's primarily the main structured method that a lot of mirror viewers use today. And that's what the military used as well. But having said that, there were also natural remote viewers in the military program who didn't use um, controlled remote viewing. Uh, controlled remote viewing was developed by a guy called Ingo Swan, the late Ingo Swan, a um, brilliant um, pioneer. Um, we, I think some people refer to him as the father of remote viewing, which I kind of agree with. And um, he was just a brilliant, brilliant um, individual, very creative as well. I'm not sure if you've heard about him. But, oh, uh, yes. Yeah, then the more I read mm-hmm. about him, you know, read penetration, read anything about him or watch his mm-hmm. interviews. I mean, he strikes me as that he was he was such a funny and quirky and lovely individual. Yeah. Yeah, he he was and but, but just just a brilliant person and um I mean we we lost a true a true talent uh, I believe when he, when he passed away. But um, he has uh, left a legacy, and there are loads and loads of um, controlled remote viewers around today. Um, professional trainers who are just taking remote viewing to a completely different level. There are groups, there are remote viewing companies working privately. Um, it's just it's just exploded, and 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 it's only going to get bigger as well, I believe as well. So when you when you started to do this, how quickly mm-hmm. did you have Success. I mean, if, if I'm just wondering, you know, if somebody's starting this, how how quickly can they progress? Um, you have to practice a lot. That's the key thing. Um, you're not gonna you're not going to become proficient at it straight away. I mean, you'll get you'll get your hits. You know, you'll, you'll you'll amaze yourself, and you'll know for for sure that it is real. Uh, within you know, once you complete your training, you will know it does work. But to become very good at it, just like anything else, you do need practice. Um, it's just like with any other art. There are those that do have natural, natural ability to excel at it. They just have that natural psychic um, ability. When they then use that along with a structured protocol and work within a protocol as well, or a method, um, it enhances that and you, you see some amazing results. Um, you know, they, these guys just describe stuff that you know just blows your mind, basically. So yeah, it, it, with, with, um, as with anything, you just need to practice, and you will get better. So, what are some of the types of of things that you can do with remote viewing? Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you can, like I said, I mean, it's it's you can go anywhere in space and time basically, um, view anything in space and time, past, present, or future. Um, and, you know, based on that, I mean, a lot of people tend to use it for predicting the future, um, sport betting, outcome, stocks, the financial markets, um, discovering new new products that haven't actually been developed yet. So basically, you're, tar- you're, you're, you're choosing a target in the future, a new technology that hasn't been developed, you bring that back into the present and try and make, you know, create a new invention that doesn't exist yet. 
you know, there's so many things you could do with it. You could use it for archaeology um, research, you know, going back into the past, finding out what happened in a certain, you know, battle or, or just, just so many things you can do with it. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. And then in locating missed people, you know, missing people. You can indeed. Um, I know there are groups out there that have used remote viewing to find missing people. Joe McMonagall being number one of them, um, he's found so many missing people in Japan. He, he's always getting invited back again, you know, to, to partic participate in live shows, finding people who've been missing for years, wow. and with the, with the you know, yeah, with the camera crew around him, and he goes, you know, they they pretty much find these people, you know, go right and go and knock on their doors, and um, there they are. Um, absolutely mind blowing stuff, and um, and I, I believe he does do a lot of work searching for missing people as well over the years he's been remote he's been remote for us well over 30 30 years if not probably 35 um wealth of experience behind him it's just a, just an amazing guy and, and and, uh, he is and i just wanted just for people that don't know who joe mcmonagall is i mean mm. he was in the the u.s army and he did uh classified operations mm -hmm. for the army security agency and it began to do the remote viewing and mm -hmm. I mean, tell us a little bit more about his life and his, where he comes from. Um, his background, uh, gosh, um, where do I even start? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll give you, I'll, I'll read out his profile for you because it, and it is very impressive uh, just to give you um, the reasons why I actually choose him as well to work on my book. Um, and hired him basically to work some of the projects that you'll be hearing about or some of the projects that you'll be hearing about later on during the show. Um, Joseph W. McMonagall was born in January, January the 10th, 1946. He joined the U.S. Army and, and, and ended up doing classified operations for the Army Security Agency. From 1964 to 1978, he was assigned to various overseas missions all over the world before ending up as the U.S. Army Intelligence and Security Command um, in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, due to a number of highly unusual events in Joe's life, such as a near-death experience and spontaneous out-of-body incidences, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the show if you've got more time, and just you know how significant those sort of things or those sort of experiences are to some people when it comes to psychic abilities. But... Um, uh, yeah, he was recruited into previously discussed and highly classified Stargate remote viewing programs. As a result of remarkable work he accomplished during the program, he was awarded the highly distinguished Legion of Merit Award for providing critical intelligence reported at the highest excellence of the U.S. military and government, including, including agencies such as the DEA, CIA, NSA, DIA, and the Joint Chief of Staff and the Joint Chief of Staff producing crucial and vital intelligence unavailable from any other source. Uh, Joe retired from the Army in 1984, but continues to provide remote viewing services via his company, Intuitive Intelligence Agencies, IIA. That is the company that I um, contacted to work some of the um, projects that you're going to, the amazing projects you're going to hear in, uh, later on in the show. And he provided some amazing, some amazing results as well. Um, he has also successfully demonstrated remote viewing on television around the world, live, and also filmed more than half a dozen times during that period. Uh, he has demonstrated on shows such as Put to the Test on ABC TV, uh, Mysteries of the Mind, Regis Digest Specials, uh, Paranormal World of Paul McKinna. A lot of these shows you can have actually find on youtube so i do recommend that you and um, the listeners um try and watch those just to get a, you know a glimpse of what um, joe can actually do um he's done numerous other shows as well um channel four shows um psychic detective episodes um he's worked in japan for nippon television and um it's just he's just an amazing guy but also like i said before he has also got the Legion of Merit Award. Now, you, you don't just get that for no reason whatsoever. He did it because of the um, accuracy and amazing work he did as a remote viewer. 
for his country, including all those agencies I've just listed out as well. So that's the guy that we're dealing with here. Wow. And he sounds like, <clears throat> he, yeah, and again, it's just like Ingo Swan. You know, when I listen to mm-hmm. him speak, it's just, uh, he's a very matter of fact, you know, down to earth mm-hmm. human being that has, oh my gosh, his, his stories. And I think, you know, you've done such a brilliant job in your book talking about him and some of the the great things that he's accomplished. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. It's just, yeah. you know, I, I, let's let's talk a little bit about your book and then <laughs> one of the, well, let's talk a lot about your book, but let's, <laughs> let's kind of go into to the Stargate program because I don't know if all my listeners are completely familiar mm-hmm. with that and, and Joe's role in that. So tell us a bit. Um, well, the whole remote viewing program itself um, – started, like I said before earlier on, in the Stanford Research Institute back in 1972, which also featured um, Hal Putoff. He designed the, um, the actual protocol, which uh, the, the actual protocol, which we um, now call remote viewing. Um, the initial project was funded by the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, and that was just, I think, with a fund of about 50,000 US dollars. And um, I think their primary psychic at the time was Ingo Swan. So he, along with him and Hal Putoff, they helped develop um, the protocol that a lot of people are now using today, the scientific protocol. Now, other partic- participants in that project um, included Keith Harari, Dwayne Elgin, Pat Price, Gary Langford, Helen Hamid, who's passed away. And, um, but eventually the project eventually ended in 1975. So that was between 1972 to 1975. That was the, pretty much the birth of remote viewing. And then after that, it then went into various army projects. Uh, I'll just list them in order from here. They're from Project Grill Frame um, from 1979 to 1983. There was Project Center Lane from 1983 to 1985, Project Dragon Absorb. Um, that was run by the Army and the CIA. Uh, from 1985 to 1986, Project Sunstreak. From 1986 to 1990, and then Project Stargate, which started by the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, and then ended up, ended up with the CIA from 1990 to 1995. Um, that's a long span, it is, and, it is. and that's yep. say that's saying something. If they're willing to put that kind of money yep. and effort into exactly. something, wow! Exactly. Yeah. So it started with just fifty thousand dollars back in 70, 1972. By the end of it, in nineteen ninety five, uh, I think they spent about twenty two uh, twenty million US dollars. Oh my lord. Oh my gosh, we're gonna. That's a, that's a lot of money, but we. That's a lot of money. Oh, this Lord, is, have mercy. Yeah, this, is imp- this is important because a lot of people say, well, you know, you know CIA you know, disbanded it because you know, they didn't feel it was working. There was a controversial report that came out at the end saying that they didn't find it very useful. Um, but all of that got blown away uh, once the Stargate archives were revealed. Oh, that's going to be fun to talk yeah. about. And I've got to just interrupt you right there. I hate that, but we are going to take <laughs> a break, our first break. And I want to just thank my fabulous guest for being here. I'm so happy to have him on the show tonight. And you can find Tunde's book on Amazon. I will give the link. I'm Erica Lukes, and we will be right back. <laughs> This is UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. The phone lines are open now at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More UFO Classified. UFO Classified. With Erica Lukes on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. After this. You're listening to UFO Classified with Erica Lukes, where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a Sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. 
To be on with Erica, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or head over to the live chat at KCORradio.com. The audience goes nuts. And now, your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. Welcome back, everybody. Yeah, this is Erica Lukes, and I'm always so stoked to be here with you, and thanks for spreading the word. I want to give a shout-out to my friends in the chat room tonight. And I am sorry, but this isn't a live show, so we can't ask questions. But I can look at the, I will be looking at the chat room to see what questions you have, and I can take them back to our guest tonight and then answer them on a later show because I know that you you will have questions. This is so cool. How could you not? My <laughs> guest tonight is my friend who I was fortunate enough to meet in London a few months ago, and we sat and talked about ufology, the problems of the world, and and the remarkable things that take place with remote viewing. He has a book out called Remote Viewing UFOs and the Visitors. What are they? Who are they? Where do they come from? Tunde Atunrashe is my guest, and he is really just, I, I just love you. I can't believe that it's taken so long to get you on the show. I mean, seriously. I know, I know, I know. I, have, I, I, I did promise I was going to try and do this a lot sooner, but work and life just got in the way. You know, you know what it's like, Eric. Oh, I do. I do. And <laughs> I just have to say that I know we we had talked in the first segment that you mm-hmm. don't do this very often. And so this yeah. is a, a real this is a real treat for everyone. Thank you very much. Excellent. No problem. At all. Um yeah, I just want to touch on what we were talking on before um uh, before the break. Yes. Which is that um about that about the amount of money that was invested in remote VN over the years. Because um, it's it's a big issue, um, and one that I think the skeptics of of remote viewing don't tend to tend to take into account. Because from fifty thousand back in nineteen seventy two all the way to twenty million nineteen ninety five, you don't get that kind of funding if you're not producing results. Okay, so this proves, as far as I'm concerned, that remote viewing does work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, that, that is that's a, a brilliant point and something yeah. that needs to be emphasized many mm-hmm. times over. Mm-hmm. And we know it did work and we know that there are examples from, you know, I mean, Hal Putoff and Joe yeah. McMonagall and all of these yeah. people mm-hmm. where they did absolutely mind-blowing things. Yeah. And Stargate was just an amazing project. But I wanted to go back to a little bit about the remote viewing protocols. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you can touch on that. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll just go back over the definition again because I'm not sure if a lot of people actually know what remote viewing actually is. So I'll just give a, a quick definition of that. Remote viewing, or RV as we call it, is the ability to perceive and communicate accurate information about places, people, concepts, or events under appropriately blind protocol without regard to distance, space, or time. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Now, um, the blind protocol normally should be a double blind protocol, which is a scientific term uh, which is used. Uh, sometimes we have um, a solo um, blind protocol whereby it's just um, just a viewer doing the target by himself. But there are a number of things that you need to be aware of as well regarding the whole protocol thing, <clears throat> and also the difference between a protocol and a method. Um, one of the things that you need to bear in mind with regard to remote viewing is remote viewing must be planned in advance. There must be verifiable feedback to judge the level of accuracy of what's been uh, psychically viewed or what's been remote viewed. Okay, so you have to have feedback. Um, now, this is one of the things that is a little bit controversial regarding the subject of remote viewing UFOs because most, most of the time there is no feedback, especially when we're actually talking about aliens. I mean, unless you've actually got a real alien, how, how, do, you know, <laughs> how do you know it's real? You know, exactly. but um, there are ways around that and things that you can actually target 
that are that have facts, proven facts. And if you target those specifically, you can get some accurate information related to the known facts of uh, things such as UFOs. Um, but then after that, it becomes a little bit you know, going into the areas of speculation. But with a with a good remote viewer, following the blind protocols, um, you can get good information. The other thing I will mention again, and it's very, very, very important for anyone listening tonight regarding remote viewing. If you've never heard of it before, just take this in, and bear this in mind. The remote viewer is given absolutely no information whatsoever about a planned target. The remote viewer uses nothing but his mind and working alone attempts to describe the target that has been assigned to him or her. In certain instances, others may be present during the actual remote viewing, but no one in the same room must have access to the target information. Um, you know, I can't stress how important that is. That is that basically is the remote viewing protocol. It's all about being blind. It's all about working on your own with no information. So now there are reference numbers, target reference mm -hmm. numbers. How do those? How do you go about? creating those? In the early days, um, when in the SRI days, when they first started out, they actually used to use things called coordinates, actual latitude and longitude coordinates of locations, thinking that, you know, the, the remote viewer will hone on to those coordinates and describe what it what is actually there. So, for instance, if it's a latitude longitude um, location, say in Africa, for example, of a, maybe a mosque or, or, or a church, and you give the exact coordinates and the remote viewer will go, will go there and describe what's there, even though he doesn't know what those, those coordinates actually are. But eventually what they soon discovered was that you don't actually need those. It was just a reference to them. The, 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 the conscious mind, uh, the subconscious mind doesn't need any um, pointers. So basically they did away with that and it just came up with inventing just random figures, numbers to identify a target. You could just create anything, X, Y, Z, one, two, three. That's the reference to the target. Is that so found, interesting? Wow. Yeah, and they, yeah, and they found that that works just as well. Can you imagine the surprise when they figured that out? That hang on a minute, you don't need you know real latitude and longitude. Code. Just give them a, just make anything up. The viewer will still go to the target. Yeah, that's. I mean, that just it's mind blowing, and it <laughs> creates. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> speechless, which is kind of a miracle. But <laughs> I know, I know. It, it's it's a hard one for people to get their minds around. They just they just can't fathom that. Like you know, really. But you know, this is why we're. This is what so this is what I love about remote viewing. <clears throat> we are all connected, in this one big. I don't know. You can call it a matrix field or such. We're all connected. All information is connected in space and time. And you know, all you need is just your intent to go from A to B. As long as you've got the intent, the subconscious knows where to go and it will go there. And that is so true. And I think that, you know, I know that I've heard Joe McMonagle talk about mm -hmm. people being artistic mm -hmm. and, you know, the kind of people that they were looking for when this started to, to kind of come into play, this whole program. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. they typically were... It, it's my understanding, and I could be wrong, but that they were trying to find people that were a bit more artistic. Was that, is yes. that right? Um, that, that is true. Um, I'm not so sure whether or not you have to be artistic to actually be a, uh, a good remote viewer. I think I'm not too sure about that, but I, it does help. Um, <clears throat> it does help as well, especially when it comes to like you know drawing, and um, which is a big part of remote viewing. Uh, that sort of thing. Um, I think for but, me, you know, with the art, the artistic <clears throat> stuff, I think that people mm -hmm. who are you know, musicians, um, mm -hmm. artists, they have the way mm -hmm. they process information is a bit different mm -hmm. than normal people, and a lot of times they're more intuitive. Mm -hmm. And and I I wonder if it's just the way our brains are wired that makes us a little bit more able to access information. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, who knows? I mean, we, 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 at, at, at this point, we just don't know how remote viewing really works. We know it's related to the whole quantum mechanics um, 
um, aspect, but we don't know exactly how it works or why it works, to be honest. Um, only that it does. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And it does. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I will tell you that the few sessions that you had me mm -hmm. do and the targets you gave me, I was just completely mm -hmm. dumbfounded at how... Well, how I mean, there were a couple of them. I was pretty accurate, I'll have to say. <laughs> you, 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 were, you were indeed, but 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 this is this is the thing. Anyone can actually do this. We all have psychic, innate psychic ability within ourselves, so we can all we can all do this. Um, you know, some people are just going to be naturally better than others. But if you take training with some of these, um, and I know it's a very controversial side of in, in the remote viewing field. You know whether training works. There's been loads of debates and arguments back and forth by some of the founding fathers of remote viewing <clears throat> who debate that you know training doesn't necessarily make you a better remote viewer. But at the same time, I have met viewers who have been trained in various um, uh, protocols like CRV, for example, and um, you know they they will categorically tell you that training has helped them. It definitely helped me. Um, but um, it's, there is a natural side of it as well, a natural ability that people have that is just as important as well. You know but what I think... Oh, yeah. sorry. I, I was just going to say that I think it's the big thing is to try to, to learn to differentiate, I mean, to take emotion out of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, basically, you just, you just need to let your mind go empty your mind completely okay meditation is the key factor here as well as far as i'm concerned anyway and the more you meditate the, the better your chances are of getting really good removing results you know if you're an expert if you're an expert you're an absolute expert at meditation i, I think you'll be a very good remote viewer especially if you go through the the train protocols as well crv and um it's just a case of just quieting your mind, letting go of any expectations of what you're doing, your outcome, and you will get the you will hit the target. Not all well, the time. I, <laughs> not all the time. <laughs> I have, I have, we, we we do have um, the, the the hit rate is not that good at the moment um, in terms of like statistic, statistical um, results, um, but a lot of people are improving, and. Um, it's 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 just getting it's just getting better. There are groups now um, being formed where people you know going to Vegas, winning you know thousands pretty much, um, and you know, practicing on a daily on a daily basis. It's just it's just you know, it's just exploding, you know. But um, yeah, it's all about it's all about development. You still have to practice. But the more you practice, the more you understand how your mind works in terms of like describing something you can't see with your own eyes. You know, remote viewing is not necessarily about what you see, it's about how you feel. How do you feel about a target? It's like imagine closing your eyes, for example, and, um, and you're trying to describe um, a building in your mind. And that's how pretty much it works. You know, and I'm just, I'm, I'm looking through your book right now and looking at some of the, the things that Joe McMonagall was, was tasked with, with mm -hmm. viewing. When you go to some of these remote viewing examples, is there a specific mm -hmm. case here that really resonates with you that was so remarkable? <laughs> You know, um, Erica. All of them are. As far as I can say, all of them are remarkable, right. uh, and they're all they all have their own um, degrees of importance. Um, but it's just the fact that he managed to describe something to, with such accuracy and, and detail, without having any information whatsoever. Um, I've ne I've never seen anything like it in my years of um, studying remote viewing. I mean, I've seen people you know describe targets very well, but not to the level that you will see in this book. Um, it's just, it's just it's just amazing. Um, the, the, for me personally, um, if I had to pick one, it would have to be the Travis Walton um, experience. Um, and that, that is a, that's a great case, even if you don't know anything <laughs> about the the remote viewing side mm -hmm. of things. But how did so? Tell us the timeline of that one. Um, oh my 
gosh. <laughs> <laughs> how, long, how, long, how long have you got? Because, well, we've got, you know, <laughs> you, we, and you can always come back, so. <laughs> um, wow. I mean, up, up, up to this point, when we started this project, I'd be giving um, Joe various targets to do. And um, we didn't have that much success with actually identifying real UFOs or extraterrestrials. A lot of it was explained away. I mean, there's some stuff that, didn't even make the book, for example, that a lot of people are not aware of. Um, I just didn't have the heart to put it into the book, you know, to tell people that, you know, what people think was UFOs turned out not to be in this particular instance. So I've left a lot of that stuff out as well. So it took quite a while before we actually managed to get real information. And one of those cases was the Travis Walter one. I mean, at this point, when I gave the target, I was like, oh, is Joe actually going to find anything out of this? Is it going to be one of those misidentification things? Uh, was it a military object? You know, I, I, I had no expectations whatsoever. But I thought this was a well-known case. Um, there were lots of witnesses. And um, we know that Travis went missing. You know, there was just so much information there that I thought, look, we can focus on the facts about the case and see what we come up with. I mean, there's no harm in trying yet, right? And uh, that's what we did. And um, so I gave the target to the project manager who works with um, Joe's, who works for Joe's company. And she um, went through the whole blind protocol, put the target into a blind, uh, into an envelope, sealed envelope. Joe has no idea what's in that envelope. He doesn't know who it's from. He doesn't know what it's about. He just takes the envelope and it's been put into a pile of other targets that he has to do at some point. So I have to then wait until he gets around to actually doing that target. Okay, and um, eventually he did get around to doing it, and I got the report, and it was just um, it was just amazing. Um, he described the I don't know if your viewers are well, the viewers must be aware of the whole Travis Walton incident, and Joe described the the basics. He described the car that the the guys were in, um, and um, he described the UFO as well. And I, I, I read the report, it's all in the book, I read the report and I'm thinking to myself at this point, I'm thinking, holy bleep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I, I, I couldn't believe it, I thought. So it, everything just, right there and then, in my mind, I'm thinking, it's real. That's, the story was real. Because you know, with you, you, you UFO stories, you always, it's back of your mind, you, you, you just, you can never be too sure. I know the witnesses are sincere in what they say they see and you know what, what you know the experiences. But for someone like myself who's skeptical um, about pretty much every, most claims anyway, until I see the actual proof of it, um, seeing that report really just it, it, it just just amazed me. And um, I think I've got the report here, so if you if you don't mind, um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to tell you what the target was because this is quite important as well. Okay. Uh, the target was what happened on November the fifth, nineteen seventy-five, to Travis Walton, and it's got the date of birth. Um, Travis uh, Travis Walton's date of birth, second uh, of October, nineteen fifty-three, and inside the same envelope, um, is please describe the target. What are the target's primary um, intentions and um, Joe describes when I got when I when I got the report Joe describes target one there are two targets target one initial perception of this target is a very bright light this is then followed by perception of two flat discs with a flat side and a boobless side the flat sides are these discs of these discs are pushed right up against one another in a way that seems to produce an extra, extraordinary amount of energy. Both discs are approximately five feet off the ground and seem to be hovering or possibly being supported by something different to see. The following can be said about the target's object. And there's a drawing and a sketch. The targets are exceptionally hard, metallic to the touch, this metal finish is an alloy with a thin coating of some kind of metal. There is a very bright light aura surrounding the two discs. There is heat associated with the aura as well. 
it is hot enough to give you a severe burn trauma. Object is approximately 35 to 40 feet in diameter. There is nothing live aboard the object. That's a very important point. There is a slight humming noise coming from the object. There are hollow parts to the object. The object finish is almost like a mirror. Object is sitting in a clearing within woods, just off to what looks like a what looks like a logging trail, and there is one human associated with this target. And um, in the book, there's a there's a lovely drawing there <laughs> with the object looks like a hamburger um, <laughs> sitting <laughs> sitting in the woods, and you've got the you've got the car um, or the, the the lorry or the truck, shall I say, um, where all the other um, witnesses were located and that was target one so straight off the bat he's actually drawn the ufo he's drawn he's drawn um a man standing next to the ufo and he's, tr- he's drawn the road and he's drawn a car by the road as well and then he goes on to describe target two so he's, just, he's seen two things here he's seen the ufo but he's, seen, he's getting, now getting something else as well so he goes target two my impressions of the target two is that it differs completely from target one which was the UFO. Target two is irregular in shape and a very dull color mixture, which is kind of bleeding, um, which is kind of bleeding all together, or blending all together. The target has panels or segments which open outward on heavy hinges. Where they have these panels, I have a sense that it is right behind the power section or where a drive motor is located. There are also clear panels which you can see through. My sense is that. These are made of glass. There is a large open flat segment of this target that is attached to the drive section of this target. The following can be said about this object. Target two is smaller than target one by half. I get a sense that there are humans associated with this target object. Uh, perhaps as many as four or possibly two. I see standing away to the side. I get a strong sense of panic among the humans like they are running away from something. People are moving from objects perceived as target one to target two, and then getting inside of target two. Target two is quickly moving away from target one. One of the people, one of the people is somehow on, but not inside of target two, and he falls off. Target one continues to pulse and glow, which is a UFO. My sense is that this was an accidental encounter. It is possible that it is possible the one person who fell off Tiger Two might be injured, because my sense tells me that he is he is prone and not moving. Tiger Two leaves the area, leaving one person on the ground. This person appears to be injured with a possible head injury. My sense is that. They're aband- they've abandoned this person to whatever may happen. And then there's a drawing of a truck, identical to the truck that the loggers were driving in. That is, that is amazing. I mean, that's just, that's unreal. That is. Mm-hmm. And I also love the way he actually described the truck because it, uh, <laughs> it doesn't actually sound like a truck where he's describing it, but it, that's, this is how remote viewing works. You, you're just basically just describing what you get. And he puts it all together and it becomes a truck. Oh my gosh. We've got to get ready for a, a break to, to come up. But um, of course, again, right when it gets good, this always happens. But um, yeah, we, we will talk more about that. But I mean, when you first read, read this, I can't even imagine. Your job must have been on the floor. It was on the floor. Uh, it was a little bit frustrating because it didn't have all the information that I wanted because it just left me hanging right at the end. Like, oh my God, there's a UFO. <laughs> Well, we're going to talk more about that when we get back. No uh, problem. So. But, Ed, you've got to get this book, Remote Viewing, UFOs and the Visitors. You can get it on Amazon. We're going to be back talking a bit more about Travis Walton, and we will see you on the other side of the break. Listen very carefully. This is Houston. Say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. This is UFO Classified. Live every Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The truth is out there. 
just waiting to be discovered. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future. For more information on the host of UFO Classified, Erica Luke's upcoming guests, as well as links to the past shows, visit her website at ufoclassified.com. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a shack just south of Area 51. Wait, that doesn't exist. This is the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Now for the news. This landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico. The rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. Brazil was the man who discovered the topper. What I thought was a star began coming in my direction at a very rapid uh, rate of speed. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. I saw a UFO and it went down the river, turned right at the United Nations, turned left and then down the river. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. No more plausible deniability. Fact. Fiction. Or the truth. You decide. And now, the new voice of the high desert, the hostess of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes. Welcome back, everyone, and happy Fantopia Friday. I would like to just give a shout out to my wonderful producer and station owner manager, Tina Marie, who always does an exceptional job with my program and every other program on KCOR. I appreciate her immensely for just being there and doing a good job being professional it is a miracle i love it but um you know make sure you tune in to some of the other great shows on this network because there are quite a few and kcor is my family i'm happy to start out a new year on this wonderful station my guest tonight is here all the way well he's not here but he's here via skype from London, and I had the, the fortune to meet him and spend time with him. I can't wait to go back there again to see him soon. He is a remote viewer, and he has authored a wonderful book called Remote Viewing UFOs and the Visitors, which is available on Amazon. And my friend, Tunde Atunrache, is here, and we're talking about the Travis Walton case, which is a case he gave Joe McMonagle. And the accuracy that he was just describing, and I'm looking at the pictures of this whole event. I'm looking at the picture of the truck that Travis and his uh, friends were in when Travis had his abduction experience. I mean, all of this is it's, it's super fine. It's really it's so cool that somebody has the the training and and can access information like this. When we left off, you were talking a bit. You know, we we're going over this case, but I know that you were reading the, the report. What else was in that report? Well, there were two questions. Uh, part one is what we just dealt with uh, regarding the actual objects, the two objects. And then the second question was, um, what are target's intentions? That's what we wanted to know. What are the target's intentions? And uh, his report continues. My sense is that this is a scout vehicle, which is unmanned. It is here to take samples of soil, air, water, and whatever else it can collect. Um, my sense is that this is my sense is that this is the intentions of Target One above. Target Two above is a different object, which was located very close to Target One. Essentially, he's talking about the truck as well. This specific target apparently isn't intelligent enough to have intentions other than to do what people tell it to do, which is basically drive a car. So this is some kind of robotic vehicle manipulated by humans, possibly a vehicle, probably a three-quarter ton pickup truck. There is a distinct and strong possibility that this object referred to as Target 1, the UFO, is possibly a multi-dimensional object. I say possibly because it occupies a different place in space than where it sits as targeted. My sense is that this is a very dangerous object, 
while it is operating within our space-time threshold. And um, that whole session took Joe about two hours and 15 minutes. And this was done on July the 26th, 2012. And I've been holding on to that information for, you know, for a couple of years before I, before I released the book. And I can tell you, it was just, it was just amazing. Uh, you know, did, have you ever talked to Travis Walton about this? He's aware of it. Um, even before, even before, we should be aware anyway, but even before I gave the report to Joe, I because I added Joe's, um, Travis to my Facebook um, list, and I sent him a message. I said, um, if you don't mind, I'm actually going to give your uh, your um, encounter to Joe to have a, have a look at, you know, remote viewing, see what we get. But I didn't, I didn't get a response. Well, I guess he probably just didn't see in time, or he probably gets those responses and just has time to reply to that. Or he probably just didn't take me serious. Um, <laughs> So, um, so I didn't hear from him. So, so I sent that off, and um, yeah, and that's that's basically what we got. So yeah, I was, I, the next time I see him, because I'm always, in fact, he'll be mm -hmm. at, at UFO Congress, I'm mm -hmm. sure, mm -hmm. and I will uh, take a copy of your book and show it to mm -hmm. him because he, yeah. I, I'm sure he'll be blown away. And I don't, I get the impression that he is not a big Facebooker, so. <laughs> 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 that could explain some of it, but this is, yeah. you know, I mean, this is really interesting. And I know with Travis's mm -hmm. case, mm -hmm. I mean, he felt, I think, especially as he began to kind of process what happened, mm -hmm. that this mm -hmm. object had actually unintentionally hurt him and they were taking mm -hmm. him aboard the craft to, mm -hmm. to heal him. Mm. I mean, I mean, also, if you look at um, Joe's description, <clears throat> it does vary somewhat from the actual... <clears throat> Sorry about that, from the actual account given, but only slightly in the sense that um, tra we, from what we understand from the story is that Travis got out of the truck. And Joe's saying that Travis fell off the truck. So there's those slight discrepancies in there. But bear in mind, Joe has no idea what he's remote viewing. He's just describing events as best as he can. Okay, so the fact that he managed to get that amount of detail, managed to identify the truck, managed to identify a, a totally unusual object, and even you know, say that it's multi-dimensional as well. It's just it's just completely mind blowing. Okay, so we had all this information. He's 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 corroborating the known facts of what we know about the um, of the events that happened that night, according to the witnesses. Um, and he has no he's been, he's been given no other information other than what he's produced himself. So I thought, okay, look. I need more information here because you've just left me hanging. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where did the craft come from? You know what I mean? And yeah, you know, what's it doing here? So um, I gave uh, I gave the project manager a new target, and the the target key was describe your impressions for this time period, the next five days post the original target date. And this is what we gave um, Joe to do. And he has again he has no he has no idea what this is all about. All he, but I wanted to find out where Travis was. He's described that he's had a head injury. Uh, you know, but you know what, what's happened to him. You know, five days. You know, what's going on? So I eventually got the report back, and this is what he says: One of the human forms present at the event site apparently has fallen backward from either an automobile or a truck, or possibly a platform of some kind. It's my perception that it was probably a vehicle of some kind because it suddenly began moving at great speed. When he fell, he struck his head quite violently on the ground. The concussion force was not very great. However, uh, it's my sense that this was an area of an open dirt or ground that is possibly covered by moss, detritus collected over time from dead leaves and smaller limb trees that have begun to rot or decay. It is the whipping action that slams his head backward that probably did most of the damage. The extent of his head degrees was sufficient to have created swelling of the brain tissue within the cranial, active, cranial cavity. All this would not have happened immediately. I believe he struck I believe he struck with enough force to be knocked unconscious for at least a period of about five to ten minutes. While regaining consciousness, he 
if you held yourself alone with whatever the object is that is putting out a very bright energy field, my sense is that he was completely abandoned by his buddies. I see him moving back towards the object in order to see if there might be someone within the object that could help him. His head at this time would be giving him considerable pain and he is probably dizzy and suffering from a lack of balance. I believe he actually touched the object more than one time and each time he touched it, he received a major jolt of electrical energy emanating from the object itself. This, on top of the fall and striking his head, would have done sufficient injury that he would have no full memory of much of this interaction. My sense is that this object is designed to drive people and animals away, while at the same time uh, jolting them with enough energy that they would have no interest or intent in pursuing the continued, the continuing contact with it. Suffering from his damage to his mental cap uh, capacities and having the swelling now impacting on his, act on his actions and or ability to think and act, he cannot remember which direction he arrived at the event scene nor would he be able to remember why he was there, who he was, etc, etc, etc. Suffering so, it is my belief that he wandered off into the woods trying to get away from the object's lights and general activity going on in that area. At some point, realising that he had left their friend at the event site, or realising that they had left their friend at the event site, they would have managed to turn the vehicle, possibly a truck or a car, around and began to return to the event site to retrieve their friend. My sense is that when they did eventually arrive at the site, what they found was that the object had departed or was in the process of departing. I get a sense that they are looking kind of up and off in a singular direction as the remnants of the light fades off in the distance, passing through the upper limbs of the trees until out of sight. It is fully dark now. They have very little light and what they do have is from a couple of flashlights and perhaps headlights from their vehicle. They are in a panic and scouring the ground looking for their friend, Travis, and calling out his name. Um, well, I'm, it, it goes on a bit further from that, so I'm just going to uh, let it off. But yeah, I mean, this is just you know amazing stuff. From, from well, when I was reading, anyway, reading the report, I just couldn't believe what I was reading. Um, but I'll continue on a little bit further on. Joe is now talking about Travis here. So he goes, their friend, meanwhile, has wandered completely away from the event site and has moved deeper into the woods. Even if he was capable of hearing them, I'm not sure he would have, he would have because of the head trauma he suffered initially. He is now nauseous, has a massive headache and feels very sleepy because of the brain swelling. All he wants to do is lie down in a soft place within the woods and sleep, which he eventually does, never acknowledging the now soft and distinct calls from his friends. It is my perception that it is getting colder and damp, and his friends rationalise that their friend has probably been taken from the area by the strange floating light they witnessed earlier. Because of this assumption, they decide to withdraw and report their experiences to the local sheriff. The sheriff has a lot of difficulty understanding exactly what it is that they are reporting. Each of them has a completely different experience from the event, and they all have equal difficulty in explaining it to them or anyone else. My perception is that the local sheriff responds as he would with any possible event of a like nature. He calls out all of his militia to look for the missing man, i.e. Travis. They go back to the general area of the event and scour it over and over again with bright lights, with bright beam lights and dogs. This produces nothing at all because their friend has awakened and in a near coma-like stupor continues to wander further and further from the search area. After 24 hours and no results at all, they cancel the search and return to their homes with the idea that perhaps his friends have been either murdered, his, his friends have either murdered him themselves or something has happened which no one can account for. Of course, in the minds of the show, the, the probability is far is for the prior. I can almost see what happens over the next few days. All of the missing man's friends and neighbours are brought in one at a time. They are interrogated. The sheriff tries to determine who has the most anger or the best reason for killing the missing man. Who was the one who set the event up and why? 
I suspect that the sheriff had no ability to come up with any evidence at all in this regard because the event was real and most likely a full contact with a UFO vehicle. I can sense that as the days pass, the missing man becomes healthier. The swelling in his brain goes down sufficiently for him to regain his senses, but he can't put the event together in his mind because all the missing pieces, because all of the missing pieces. I get a sense that eventually he comes upon a building of some kind and is able to contact someone by using a phone. They simply drive out and pick him up. He now appears to be suffering from very little trauma, having recovered most of his mental faculties and evidence of his head damage being pretty much mitigated by time. Of course, he is suffering from a mild case of amnesia, severe dehydration, and has missed enough meals to have lost considerable weight. Sleeping in the wild, not completely understanding what happened to him, and having segments of memory of the UFO experience probably gave him nightmares for quite some time afterwards. The entire episode, I sense, transpired over a period of perhaps four or five days. It's difficult to tell because when I try to get into the mind of the missing man, it becomes quite confusing and complicated. My sense is that he really was suffering from a severe brain drama and damage to his memory, both short and long term. And that was um, done on August the 15th to the 20th. About took about one and a half hours of remote viewing. Now, that was probably one of the longer reports that Joe's actually did for me. And um, he's pretty much described quite a lot in there. He hasn't. I mean, it, it's so fascinating because it's so detailed mm. and accurate. It, if you were a skeptic looking at that, you'd say, well, OK, this guy just read an article and he knew mm. it was Travis Walton. I mean, <laughs> yep, yep. Um, uh, the fact that he he's confirming that it's a UFO event, a real UFO event. I mean, that was the biggest shock um, of all at that point. Um, but again, it still left me wanting. I was like, well, okay, we know it's a UFO. Where did it come from? That's, this is me. This is this is my um, uh, curiosity now um, coming forth. I just wanted to know, you know, where did, where did it come from, and uh, who sent it. Um, the fact that he doesn't see Joe being picked up by the UFO, or you know, he sees him wandering around in the forest with a head trauma, mm -hmm. that doesn't, in my mind, that doesn't take away anything from the fact that you know Joe um, Travis recalls being taken aboard a ship or waking up aboard a ship. And then, you know, seeing these human beings. It could be, because the, the object itself is multi-dimensional multi in nature, it could be that the whole event uh, was multi-dimensional in itself, and that they could have taken Travis and returned him to the exact point they took him. And he could have been gone for days. We, we, just, we just don't know. Right. And there, there is a, there is history. I'll put that in the book as well. There's a history of a case of a guy who had a similar encounter. Again, was gone. For, you know, he disappeared, reappeared within a few minutes in front of other witnesses. But he had a five-day growth of beard on his face. <laughs> and this is a well-known this is a well-known UFO case, by the way. Um, right. So you know, it, it's it's a very, very, very strange event, and it also shows that you know, look. We just don't know exactly what we're dealing with here, especially if you know, we're talking about UFOs being multidimensional in nature. There is so much we don't know. No, we don't. We, I mean, and I, it's it's hard because we all yep. come into this trying to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. We all come into it with a bias, and and we put limitations, our own limitations, on things. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. you know, yeah, like you said, we don't know what we're dealing with, and and I think we miss out on a lot of mm -hmm. information because we do that but that's just it's incredible and with with joe and and ingo swan both i mean what were their feelings on extraterrestrials here on earth or something visiting us um well they've they have their own um views about it in terms of like you know, from their experience of working remote viewing and I suspect doing quite a few of these um, type of targets. Um, 
I mean, I've, I mean, I've got a list here of what Joe actually believes about uh, the remote viewing thing, and it's quite detailed. I do recommend also, if people have the time, to go onto YouTube, and you know, there's loads of conferences there where Joe's talked about these things, and he goes in depth as well as to what he believes about the whole extra, extraterrestrial thing. I believe firmly that they both believe aliens do exist. Mm-hmm. Um, Ingo, I mean, you know about Ingo's story and penetration. It's just a remarkable book. Um, and if those events are proven to be true, I mean, it's just it's just amazing. Uh, yeah. uh, not, not only that, I mean, what else is going on that we're not being told about? You know, I mean, again, assuming, of course, this is this is this is this is true. So there there is a lot of stuff that we just do not have enough information information on. And um, but this really did open my eyes uh, quite a lot. And just moving on a little bit from the whole Travis thing, I mean, we still didn't know exactly where that craft came from, so I gave another target to Joe to do with various other questions. And um, I don't know if we've got enough time to go through that, but that in itself was, again, another amazing experience because we then tracked where the object actually came from. Um, Joe describes that it came from the Sirius star system, Mm -hmm. and he then describes... In, in uncanny detail, exactly what's going on in the star system, um, why the aliens from that star system are visiting Earth, and the implications for Earth in the long term future. Yes, and we need to definitely <laughs> go into that right after we get back from our from our last break because that that's really that, that's the million dollar question. For, mm-hmm. for everybody and you know who are they why are they here and yep. that is just fascinating and I, I know that we're going to talk about that and I'm really sad that we must have you back because we didn't even talk about the Japan Airlines flight that you uh, have uh, in your book in 87 <laughs> because mm-hmm. again and you know maybe if we can move through things and we can we can talk about that but that was a phenomenal case mm-hmm. And it is, and, and then Brendelsham, I mean, you've got so much great information in your book, but yeah. you know, like I, I want to just tell my, my friends, you need to go to Amazon and get remote viewing UFOs mm-hmm. and visitors and, and read this book and read, read the accuracy that mm-hmm. Joe McMonagall demonstrates with the remote viewing and learn more about that. And then it just opens up so many questions yeah. For all of us and the implications, yeah. it's wonderful. Do you have, before we go to break, do you have plans to write another book? <laughs> if if um, I did, and if, if it was going to be about remote, if it was going to be about UFOs, um, I would like to have Joe McMonagall on board again. But um, I think he has retired from official remote viewing projects. So, sadly, that's probably not going to happen. And the only reason why is because I, mean, I started the project with him. And um, I've seen the work he can produce. I trust his um, ability to work in protocol and, um, and the, the whole professional, you know, professional aspect of his work is just, it's just second to none. So, but he's retired, you know, it's probably down to the next generation of movies now to try and step up and Carry the thing, hmm. carry, carry things forward. Well, interesting. You never know what can transpire. And I, I'm just going to put that <laughs> little bug in your ear. You should write another book, but that's <laughs> well, in your spare never, time. You know, never, pull yourself away that. from the keyboards. You got to <laughs> write some, write some music, and then write another book. But I am Erica Luke. So I want to just thank all of you for being here, and all my people in chat. And I'm sorry that it is not a live show, but. Ask, give me questions, and I will get them to my guest, and I will reveal them on a different show. We will take our last break, and we will be right back. Stand by. This is UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. The phone lines are open now at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. 9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More UFO Classified. UFO Classified. With Erica Lukes on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. After this. You're listening to. You're listening to. You're listening to. UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. 
where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a Sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. To be on with Erica, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or head over to the live chats at KCORradio.com. The audience goes nuts. And now, your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you're enjoying your Friday evening here on KCOR. And stick around because there will be, as always, a great night of powerful females on the network with one of my favorite people in the world, Tina Marie, on restricted airspace and hyperspace with Solaris Blue Raven. So get your jammies on, get a margarita, and hunker down for the night. I am always happy to be here on UFO Classified. Make sure you find me on Facebook and my my web page, which is ufoclassified.com. I try to give all of you some good information, some good resources of places to look for old archives, places to go for current time research, and I will keep updating that. And if you have any suggestions, send me a link, please. My friend tonight and guest from London is Tunde Atunrache, and he has a book, Remote Viewing, UFOs and the Visitors, and we've been talking about Joe McMonagall's remote viewing session of Travis Walton. And so we're going to continue where we left off because there is much more to this story. Yes, indeed, there is a lot more. Um, <laughs> and, and a lot of it I just wasn't expecting at all. I mean, so we started with Travis Walton, the, the whole you know incident in the forest, and it literally takes us literally out of this world and beyond. <laughs> So I'll continue on. So we knew uh, uh, we had the information about the, the the UFO itself and what happened to Travis, but I didn't know where the craft actually came from. We wanted to know where the craft came from. And this is all just based on Joe's information. So I've created another set of targets or a target with various questions in it. I wanted to know where did the craft come from? What was it? What were the propulsion systems and technologies used in the craft and who was responsible for sending it there and for what purpose? So I gave the information over to the project manager. She can uh, she can continues with the same um, target ID, target 62912, continued, sealed envelope with the questions, what is the origin, beginning point of travel from which this object you described comes? Describe how it got from there to here. Okay, so this is the UFO that Joe's described in his remote viewing session. Again, no information has been given to him. He doesn't know it's about Travis. He doesn't know about him. He may at this point maybe have some inclination. I don't know, but because of because of the level of detail that he's got in there. But as a remote viewer, you tend to pull that aside and you don't even think about that. You just describe what you get from the target. And um, so I got Joe's report back um, several weeks later. Origin, beginning point of travel. This place is called by many names, but is primarily known as the Dog Star, officially Sirius, which is the brightest star in our night sky. It is also known as Canicula, Latin for little dog. Asher, Alpha Canis Majoris, Sothis, uh, name given by the Egyptian astrologers of ancient times, and um, uh, he mentions various other names as well. The star is probably the most important star in the sky to most of the ancient world's cultures, as many of those cultures talk of men who travelled from this star and or its companion, which is not visible to the naked eye. I get the impression that all of this object's interest circles the companion to Alpha Canis Majoris, so what's going on it has something to do with the dwarf star, Bravo Canis Majoris, which is basically Sirius, uh, Sirius B. Where Canis Majoris lies, 
has everything to do with why we are having contact with entities from that star place. Sirius is approximately 6.5 light years from planet Earth. It is one of the closest stars to us. My perception is that there are probably seven planetoids currently circling that star. Of these, at least three are inhabitable from an Earth-like viewpoint. These have blends of breathable gases, which we could which we could survive breathing, although our atmosphere has a light variation, which is different. The difference has to do with mostly with helium and other inert gases. What led me to this constellation was the impression of a dog chasing a hunter through the woods. At first, I concentrated on the hunter, but that didn't seem to be where the information was, com was centered. So I switched to the dog and got an impression of unconditional love or commitment to life. This seemed to be an appropriate line of understanding. My sense is that there is an intelligent life form that originates from this star system and they have a major interest in all other inhabitable stars within reach of their own for some mysterious reason. This leaves me with some other rather interesting perceptions, mm -hmm. such as why would any entity want to make any kind of contact with us? So I asked the question and got fed back to what I, to what I was originally drawn to in the first place, the unconditional mm -hmm. love of a dog. That and the fact that we are not the only ones that are apparently concerned about, that they are apparently concerned about. This is, a, this is about what's good for a much larger group and not specifically aimed at individuals. I get the impression that we are not the only intelligent beings between here and Sirius Alpha. I keep getting an impression of a very large envelope surrounding the Sirius Starlet Coal and within this very large envelope, we, as well as dozens, if not hundreds, of other intelligent species currently exist. Some of these entities are well ahead of us, and of course, some are behind us in terms of development. Within this envelope are millions of stars, the majority of which are uninhabitable. Our perception of this envelope expanding outwards like a perfectly round ball or perhaps a balloon is that it is probably not a good thing, or at best, it is a good thing and a bad thing simultaneously. I suspect the more advanced intelligent species out there understand perfectly what is going on, and this is a good thing too. They understand, hence why this particular view is a good view of what's going on. The good thing has to do with changes to DNA, some of which most rudimentary forms of DNA. So it has something to do with the spread of a kind of radiation that alters DNA. Much of even much of even most of the DNA is altered to the point of being sterilized completely. So this is a kind of like the way we preserve food or sterilize things like those we use in hospitals at present. When food is cooked and stored or when an object is sealed in plastic for later use within a surgical suit, we usually sterilize it by passing it through a major source of gamma rays. I get the sense that this is what probably happened or this is, I get a sense that this is what's probably going to happen. Some DNA, which exists at a very rudimentary animal level, or animal life, is the deepest pits of oceans and water across the universe will be enveloped by gamma rays. And this small dose that reaches the bottom of these very deep rifts will be just enough to alter the DNA of primitive life forms. So they begin to grow and change in some way that eventually produces a form of life that is intelligent. This is probably how we started, how our own species began at some point in the dawn of existence. Um, now, I could go on a little bit more, but there's quite a lot of information on this one. But basically, what he's saying is that he sees Sirius uh, B, which is a dwarf planet, a uh, dwarf star, um, at some point will go Nova. And when that happens, which is going to be probably, I'll say, hundreds of thousands of years in the future. That's when a good it thing. does go Nova, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> when that does happen, it is going to affect all life on Earth. Hence the reason why they're coming to Earth, you know, for mysterious reasons, you know, interested in our water, um, plant life, possibly even humans, I don't know. And um, that's the feeling that he got from that start of season as to why that object was there in the forest at that time. Okay. 
<laughs> so how many, I mean, oh, geez. So how many other different uh, species does he think are, are here interacting with us? I know that in the book there is a, a picture of a being. Mm-hmm. Well, there's two pictures. Um, he drew a picture of a being um, associated with the flights and JL encounter, which unfortunately we probably don't have time to go into today. Um, but I do recommend readers look into that because that was the first time that we actually got accurate information regarding or uh, information linked to extraterrestrials. And um, it's an amazing story. You've got to read it. Um, you know what? I think we do have a we do have a little bit of time, so let's try to get as much uh, in there as we can because okay. I think that not only is this probably one of the best uh, cases with mm-hmm. radar and mm-hmm. uh, and mm-hmm. just an interesting story about what happened to the captain and how he lost his job and all of these different things. But this was a real big and important event. So with that said, this happened in 1987 over mm-hmm. Alaska, Japan Airlines uh, flight. And, you know, so go, to go, let's try to go over as much of it as we can from your perspective, from what you've shared in the book. Um, well, again, this was um, a Japan Airlines flight um, on the 16th of November, I believe it was, 1986. Um, it was piloted by Captain Kenju Teriuchi, who was an ex fighter pilot with more than 10,000 hours of flight experience. And in his cockpit, he also had a co-pilot, Tandori Tamjifuji, in the right-hand seat, and he also had Yoshia to scuba. Uh, the routine cargo flight entered Alaska airspace uh, on autopilot on the 17th of November, 1986, cruising at 565 miles per, uh, miles per hour. At approximately 5.11 p.m., all three crew members witnessed two unidentified objects to the left below them. The objects then rose above them and continued to follow their plane. The two objects were described as rectangular arrays of light grouped together which looked like mini thrusters. Um, within that encounter they also then came across an object, a gigantic object, um, which they called a spaceship uh, on the port side that was twice the size of an aircraft carrier. I mean, if you know how big an aircraft carrier is, can you imagine times two? <laughs> no, no. Not when I'm <laughs> in a plane. No, I can't. <laughs> yeah, flying right next to a jumbo jet, basically. Um, the pilots requested an immediate change of course due to the presence of this intimidating, unident- unidentified visitor. Um, Anchorage Air Traffic Control obliged, requested another plane within the vicinity, I think within the vicinity, a United Airlines flight to confirm the unidentified traffic. The huge craft, however, simply followed uh, JAL 1628 in exact formation to any change of direction the captain made. So basically, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to get, you know, escape from it, but he just couldn't. Right, and it, there is an interesting thing in the the report that I'm looking mm. at that does say that uh, Teriyuchi turned his his plane in a complete circle to see if the lights would follow, and they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, he just stuck with them. And um, so, yeah, this this was a very interesting case. Um, uh, he, I mean, they requested for uh, I think Anchorage also asked if they needed any fighter or military assistance, and they said no. It's probably a good idea, to be honest. Um, you don't want to be shooting down something that size, uh, flying around in the skies. But, uh, yeah, um, an amazing case. So uh, what kind of hits did did did, uh, did Joe get on this case? Well, I wanted to find out what really happened to flight JAL 1628. What were the strange objects the crew encountered, and why was the CIA and FBI particularly interested in the radar data? Um, I, gave the, I gave the target to Joe. Uh, on the 23rd of February 2012, I emailed him. Um, oh, sorry, I received an email from Joe, uh, or from his uh, project manager, uh, with the results of the target. Again, following all the same protocol that we've used in all the other projects, which is basically everything is blind. Joe's not given any information whatsoever. And um, the target we gave him was 
watch JAL 747 encountered over Alaska, November 17, 1986 at 1710. And this is what Drove described. Target is a classic UFO, approximately 490 to 500 feet in length, 200 to 230 feet across in width, and about 55 to 65 feet in depth or thickness from top to bottom. Object has a mirrored black finish, which is capable of changing from an opaque shiny surface with extreme perceptive depth to flat black and near invisibility, except for what might be blocked out by virtue of its size. I mean, we're talking about a huge, I can't even, I can't even, describe how big that is. That's, I mean, to be flying right next to you as well. The object is capable of speeds of in excess of 4,000 miles per hour, but can come but can come to a near complete standstill if needed. The specific speed of the object at the time of targeting is approximately 525 to 540 miles per hour, basically matching the flight JLL's speed. My sense is that at specific times of targeting, it is following another aircraft or man-made object. Engine output is directly aft of the center line hump and above the horizontal center line. Engine output is protected from heat detection and the entire vehicle is a stealth type of vehicle with the capacity to be invisible to normal radar. Altitude at time of targeting is approximately 33,000 feet plus or minus 1,000 feet. Topping altitude in deep space and its low end altitude is 2,000 feet below water surface. Vehicle is capable of extreme maneuvers and sudden locational shifts and speeds. It can almost to um, it can appear to almost disappear and reappear at will. Power is nearly unlimited, provided it has access to certain minerals and water. A lot of the power deals directly with Electromagnetic, electromagnetic fields for controlling the power fluctuations and manipulations. I have a very strong case, I have a very strong sense that this vehicle is fully automated and unmanned. I have a very strong feeling that some other human made airborne craft became involved with the retrieval process initiated by the UFO and it mistakenly identified the human vehicle as one of its own. Confusing a, pro confusing a probe pickup Erratic behavior by the human craft confused its procedures for a momentary period of time, but then it successfully completed its scheduled probe pickup and disappeared by rapidly flying off. Origins of the target are, and then Joe provides a detailed star map of where he feels the um, object came from. And it he goes on. Go on, sorry. No, no, no. I mean, I'm just, again, <laughs> uh, you know, quite blown away in the way he mm -hmm. describes, you know, the the object being near invisible and mm -hmm. and things. I mean, we, we, we look back and some of the descriptions he gave with some of the cases that I've investigated and many others. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is mm -hmm. just, this is, is it was very remarkable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, he goes on to describe the actual map. Um the star map and the location, the distance of where the stars are. And um, the, just getting on from his report, he goes, the above ship would be called a mother ship. There were two or three other smaller ships called vehicular probes, which were involved in the confusing incident. All three have been seen by the US military and are known to the US military and federal government. That's very important. Tasking of this remotely piloted vehicle is unknown. Species responsible for this remotely piloted vehicle are unknown. Name of the specific race or star system for this RPV, where this RPV is from, is unknown. The unknowns above are unknown because they reflect from the language or identity of the species that created the RPVs and cannot be translated. However, it is my sense that this specific species and craft have been interacting with planet Earth and other planets within our solar system for nearly 50 years. These RPVs are biological machines interface, are biological machine interfaces which have been engineered to remain online for another approximate 50 years before they will self-destruct and or be replaced by newer models. Um, I 
I mean, I was, you know, when I first got this, I was like, no way. I mean, this is just unbelievable. Um, it was the first case of actual remote, um, extraterrestrial data that I'd received throughout this project when we started. So uh, it was just, it was just amazing. Um, we now had a star map as well, so I had to then try and figure out exactly where this star was located. And the, and the closest fit that I could get was a red dwarf star called Ross 154. Now, all the details are in the book for the you know, listeners, uh, for the people listening to the show. All the details are in the book. And um, I'm always interested in you know, comments of you know, if there's any other star that might fit in with this data. But Ross 154 was the nearest star that we could locate that matched that, um, that, matched that star. And it's not that far away in terms of light, in terms of light years. It's only 9.6 light years away. Oh, isn't that interesting? And two, mm-hmm. one thing that you mentioned in your book is, and you just mentioned it a, a couple minutes ago, is the fact that they're here and they're they're u- utilizing rare earth elements and, and yeah. water. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that, I mean, that goes along with what, I've said, and what many others have said, just because you look at the data, and that's certainly where mm-hmm. it's pointing. So, mm-hmm. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and not only that. I mean, it, there's, I'll be tasking them again to get more information as regarding the um, origin of the craft, you know, the people that sent it, and what they looked like. And then in the book, there is a whole description of the planets, the people. There's even a description of the alien, what they look like, and. Um, and then what, what, what their interests are with, with, with Earth. Uh, See, so that's going to make people get the book. I'm telling you right there. <laughs> you know, Erica, I mean, we just, we just don't have enough time. Um, it's, just, it's just quite sad because I feel there's so much information here. I mean, I've got like six cases here that Joe did. And we've, and we've barely touched on two of them. And yeah, all I told them you this had happened. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Well, it just means that we're going to have to make time and maybe I'll just have to fly over to London and we can, you mm-hmm. know, hang out and do yeah. a show over there. I love it over there. But but this is this has been so wonderful. I knew it would be. And I <laughs> am thrilled. And, you know, like I said, everybody go get this book, Remote Viewing, Reviewing UFOs and the Visitors on Amazon. And if you have any questions tonight that I can get to my guest, please give them to me on UFO Classified or on my my website we Mm -hmm. appreciate it and oh my gosh i just wish you the best of luck and i know that we'll be chatting very soon oh yes we will (laughs) (laughs) and if you're in the phoenix area in february please come to to the ufo congress it should be a really uh remarkable experience there we're going to be talking about how to change the course of all of this and move in a productive way I want to thank all of you for for supporting me, for wanting to find out good information, and for being kind and respectful, and just being the good people that you are. I'm really lucky to have all of you as as listeners and supporters. You mean a lot to me. And I, I again, Tunde, thank you so much for being here. You rock. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. For, thank you for having me. Uh, I mean, again, I'm just uh, a little bit sad that we couldn't go through a lot more in depth into some of the cases we will um, we will and we will talk soon and i can hear that music so that means the show is over oh no no, (laughs) dang it but have a wonderful weekend and be safe everyone we will see you next week listen very carefully this is houston say again please This is UFO Classified, live every Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The truth is out there, just waiting to be discovered. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future. For more information on the host of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes, upcoming guests, as well as links to the past shows, Visit her website at ufoclassified.com. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a shack just south of Area 51. Wait, that doesn't exist.